<laughs> I sense positive vibes, great vibes. This is awesome. Uh, do want to share that uh, there is a Q&A chat box where people can drop, uh, you can drop your questions. This is a webinar format. Therefore, only the uh, panelists will be able to speak. Now, there, we do have the ability to allow people to talk. Um, uh, if people want to ask a question verbally, just please let us know and we will accommodate uh, this request. Also, we will be recording this session. There will be other sessions, other panels throughout the Lacuni Institute that will be recorded. However, there are some that will not be recorded uh, as to respect the privacy and the wishes of our presenters. Therefore, there will be a mixture of, uh, of sessions and we will make these recordings available via YouTube, hopefully uh, by uh, the fall of 2023 under the presidency of uh, Vice President Derek Stadler when he takes the mantle this on July 1st. So good morning. My name is Nelson Santana and I am assistant professor, deputy chief and collection development librarian at Bronx Community College of the City University of New York. I am also president of the Library Association of the City University of New York, LACUNY, and co-chair of the LACUNY Institute Planning Committee. I am joined by Professor Derek Statler, associate professor and web services librarian at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York. And uh, Derek is also, again, the co-chair of the LACUNY Institute and also vice president of LACUNY. Great to have you, Derek. Uh, by the way, Der Derek is just uh, multifaceted. He's he is here with us today, joining us, and he is also physically at his, at another conference, right? So this goes to show. Yes, just <laughs> yes, I'm busy today. Actually, I just presented uh, at the Long Library Conference, and now I'm at the Lacuni Institute. This could not have happened pre-COVID. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Derek. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today at the Lacuni Institute 2023 conference. It is only appropriate to thank everyone who made this two-day conference possible. The presenters, everyone who registered, the Lacuni Executive Council, the membership, uh, the Lacuni delegates, the Lacuni Institute Planning Committee, and our sponsors. We thank our sponsors. Uh, our gold sponsors are EBSCO, Sage, and Scopus. Our silver sponsors are Third Iron Advanced Library Technologies, Bronze Sponsors, American Mathematical Society, AMS, and OCLC. It is important to acknowledge all members of the LACUNY Institute Planning Committee. If you are the coworker of any of these individuals, consider yourself fortunate, fortunate to work with these people. And you know, I just think it's important to mention their names. Uh, Professor Derek Statler, LaGuardia Community College, Professor Nora Almeida, New York City College of Technology, Professor Wynette Clyde, New York City College of Technology, Professor Jeffrey Delgado, Kingsborough Community College. Professor Diane Gordon Conyers, LaGuardia Community College. We have a big contingent from LaGuardia and New York City Tech. Professor Iris Finkel, Hunter College. Professor Nanette Johnson, New York City College of Technology. Dr. Linda Miles, Austos Community College. Professor Asia Pefek, Hunter College. Professor Mark Aaron Poger, College of Staten Island. Professor Alexandra Rojas, LaGuardia Community College and Professor Julie Turley, Kingsborough Community College. Several colleagues deserve a special mention. Derek Stadler, as co-chair and vice president, stepped up and was un, was an in, has been an invaluable partner in putting together the Institute and also as a member of the Executive Council. Jeffrey Delgado, immediate past president, handled so many administrative matters from leading the committees for the Dalia Leonardo Scholarship and Jay Bernstein Award to submitting important documents pertinent to the association, such as to the IRS, to working diligently with Iris Finkel to secure this year's sponsorship. Gracias, hermano. Nandy Prince and Matthew Dinero. You both did a phenomenal job as secretary and treasurer, respectively. Mark Aaron Poger handled so many behind the scenes details that I have no idea how someone can manage this load. Lacuni is indebted to you, Mark, and, and this is true. He's handling the nominations, the registrations, etc. The Library Association of the City University of New York, LACUNY, has been in existence since 1939. Thus, we are celebrating the 84th, anni 84th anniversary of this organization's existence. 
LACUNY is a professional association and a model that institutions of higher learning across the nation and or associations in our profession can study and emulate. Many LACUNY past presidents or members in other leadership roles within the organization have moved up the academic ladder, becoming chief librarians or holding other key administrative positions, such as Ken Schlesinger, Madeline Ford, Simone Yearwood, all current chief librarians, and Lucinda Soy, who served as senior university dean and vice provost of academic programs and policy at CUNY. And I believe she retired last year, if I'm not mistaken. Many more LACUNY members have made important interventions through their scholarship, including Sara Ponte, Lisa Ellis, Maura Small, and the list continues. The LACUNY Institute is a necessary and important platform where many of us learn firsthand about our colleagues' work. And I believe colleagues across the nation are taking notice as we have grown LACUNY from a local to a national conference. LACUNY is located quite possibly within the greatest university system in the world, and CUNY itself is perhaps the best university system for librarians. Perhaps I see CUNY as a bastion of hope, where we have been protecting faculty status for librarians within a university system that offers many professional development opportunities to its faculty. LACUNY's yearly premier events is the LACUNY Institute, where we are gathered today. Although the pandemic brought an air of somberness, it also gave us some positive delights, such as turning LACUNY from a regional to a national conference. Many of this year's presenters come from local CUNY institutions, hence our plenary speakers, as well as institutions of higher learning in the New York area, including St. John's University, the Fashion Institute of Technology, and SUNY Binghamton. We also have presenters from across the United States, including the University of Arizona, the DC Public Library, Drexel University, University of Massachusetts Amherst, University of Louisville, Texas Tech University, the Alder Graduate School of Education in California, and the list goes on. Several presenters hail from up north, Canada, representing institutions such as Wilfrid Laurier University and the University of British Columbia. This year's institute theme is Evolving Library Through Professional Development. Professional development is an integral component of librarianship as a field that is always evolving and that is intertwined with technology. Librarians, library workers, and information professionals across related fields and disciplines often seek professional development opportunities that contribute to their professional growth. I should share that the theme of this year's institute grew out of a conversation between Robert Farrell at Lehman College and Charles Keyes at LaGuardia, and the planning committee ran with this idea. We have a fantastic lineup of presentations, including a plenary panel immediately after this opening session. However, before introducing our keynote speakers, we want to acknowledge some of our colleagues who recently received LACUNY awards. I now present Vice President and LACUNY Institute Co-Chair, Derek Stadler. Let me get my notes up. I hope it's not too noisy over here, then you can all hear me. I didn't think I would have all this noise at a library conference. But. All right, so one of the benefits of being a member of the community are the awards and professional development opportunities available to library and information science students and librarians. Uh, the Dahlia M. Leonardo uh, Award uh, was named after Dahlia M. Leonardo, who served as president of CUNY from July 2011 to July 2012. Her scholarship reflected her interest in early modern European history and the library sciences. In honor of her lifelong contributions to the field, CUNY created the Dahlia Leonardo Library School Scholarship, which provides a $750 stipend as well as a one-year sponsored membership to the CUNY and is awarded annually to two current library school students. This year, the recipients are, and I hope I get these names correct, I apologize if I don't, Nikolaine Chivanovic, uh, CUNY Graduate School of Library and Information Science at Queens College, Alia Wasco from the Long Island University Palmer School. My alma mater. The Jake Bernstein Award. Uh, the the, uh, the, the 
Jay Bernstein Memorial Scholarship is an annual award given in memory of the late Jay Bernstein, a librarian at Kingsburg Community College. Jay particularly valued scholarship as a critical component of our work as librarians. And this annual award honors Jay's scholarly legacy and recognizes the scholarly achievements of a Kuni librarian. This year's recipient of the Jay Bernstein Award is Professor Cesara Aponte from City College. So we want to thank the community members for their service in administering these two awards. They are Jeffrey Delgado, Kate Cawley, Lynn Glisson, and Mandy Prince. Every fall and spring semester, the, the, the Lacuni Professional Development Committee awards professional travel grants of up to $600 to full Lacuni members. The recipients of the 2022-2023 academic year are Caitlin Colban, Kristen Fredrickson, Jennifer Newman, Colleen Bradley Sanders, and Iris Fink. We thank Michelle Aaron Price and Nanny Prince for co-chairing the Lakini Professional Development Committee and also the colleagues who serve as judges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Fantastic. Um, I for, believe I forgot to mention that closed caption is provided. So you can see. Oh, I apologize. I've been, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for notifying me. I will copy what I put in the text for to panelists, to the attendees in one moment. I apologize for this. Thank you. And yes, so closed captioning is also available if there is anyone who needs to turn it on. Now, given the theme of this year's Lacuni Institute, the evolving library through professional development, we decided to mount a panel and invite three scholars who can speak on professional development. The aim of this plenary panel is to explore professional development as a cross-disciplinary and collective activity that shapes individual scholars and institutional cultures. For today's plenary panel, we invited representatives from institutes, centers, and organizations from within CUNY to share the history of the organization, how they connect with scholars within and outside of CUNY, and the ways in which their work supports collective and individual professional development and scholarship. Since the COVID pandemic, most Lacuni Institute conference attendees are information professionals from outside the City University of New York. Therefore, one purpose of this panel is to showcase professional development opportunities and resources available to researchers at CUNY and beyond. The format of this panel involves the moderators, Derek and I, asking questions, and the panelists will answer these during our conversation. Our attendees are free to leave questions in the chat box or the Q&A chat, and we will introduce our panelists right now. Professor Sara Ponte is the Chief Librarian of the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute and Professor at the City College of New York Libraries. She founded the Dominican Library in 1994 with donations of books by the Council of Dominican Educators, and she is the first Dominican librarian solely dedicated to Dominican studies in the United States. She assists scholars and students undertaking research on Dominican issues and conducts educational workshops using archival and library resources. Professor Ponte is the author of Dominican Blackness and Dominican Diaspora, Oxford Libraries 2021 and 2017. La Presencia Dominicana en el Periódico Las Novedades, 1876-1918, de breve mención a propietarios en la ciudad de Nueva York. Published by Biblioteca Nación Pedro Enriquez Ureñas. And winner of the 2013 Jose Toribio Medina Award, which is awarded by the Seminar on the Acquisition of Latin American Library Materials, Salam. Co-author with Dr. Franklin Gutierrez, among others. Uh, Professor Aponte holds an MLS in Library and Information Sciences from Queens College, an MSED in Higher Education Administration from Baruch College, a BA in International Studies from the City College of New York, and an AA in Liberal Arts from Osos Community College, uh, a true CUNY uh, person, <laughs> or, well, you know, raised and, and, and educated, et cetera, in CUNY. Um, 
Dr. Brenda M. Green, who has committed her life to teaching, learning, and scholarship, is the founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature, director of the National Black Writers Conference, and professor of English at Medgar Evers College of the City University of New York. Dr. Green's research and scholarly work include composition, African-American literature, and multicultural literature. She is the editor of the African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas, co-editor of Resistance and Transformation, Conversations with Black Writers, published by Morton Books in 2010, Meditations and Accessions, Black Writers on Writing, Redefining Ourselves, Black Writers in the 90s, and Rethinking American Literature, National Council of Teachers of English, published in 1997, Dr. Green has extensive essays, grants, book reviews, and presentations in English studies and literature. Dr. Green's educational leadership and professional accomplishments span over 40 years. Before coming to Medgar Evers College in 1980, she taught at the Board of Education and was director of the Right to Read program at Malcolm King College Harlem Extension. As a scholar and literary activist in English studies and African diaspora literature, Dr. Green has led literary and writing seminars. Dr. Green has also continued the tradition of directing and hosting the National Black Writers Conferences that have been given at Medgar Evers College since 1986. The proud mother of two sons, Talib Kweli Green and internationally known hip hop artist Anjamo K. Green, professor of constitutional law at Columbia University and the grandmother of Amani, Diani, Ria, Ayan, Kian and Justice, Dr. Green attributes the success of her sons to the importance that she and her father stressed about realizing, identifying, and pursuing one's passion. Dr. Christina Katopoulos, PhD, is a postdoctoral research associate and the associate director of Transformative Learning in the Humanities, a three-year initiative at the City University of New York, CUNY, supported by the Mellon Foundation. She is the winner of the 2019 Diana Colbert Innovative Teaching Prize and 2018 Dewey Digital Teaching Award. She has authored or co-authored articles published in ESQ, a journal of 19th century American literature and culture, IO, ISLE, Interdisciplinary Studies in Literature and Environment, MLA's Profession, Hybrid Pedagogy, Inside Higher Ed, and Times Higher Ed. With Kathy N. Davidson, Katopoulos is author of The New College Classroom, published by Harvard University Press in 2022, a book that in fact draws from Bell Hooks, Audrey Lord, and Paulo Freire to offer practical examples and extensive research on how to actually do active, equitable, inclusive teaching in any classroom, any discipline, and any kind of university in both introductory and specialized classes. Okay, after this long introduction, we are now ready to uh, begin our plenary session. Uh, we will start with the first question. The Lacuni Institute is a conference geared toward librarianship and related fields. And at times we work in silos. Even if many of us are employed or affiliated in some way to the same institution, in this case CUNY, we may not necessarily know of each other's work due to the large university system that we are a part of. Can you please share with some with us here today background about yourself, such as the CUNY institutions you're affiliated with, your discipline, how long you have been at CUNY, and the work that you do at CUNY? And all three can answer the questions, and uh, it, you can go in whatever order you would like. Or should we go in alphabetical order? Does that work? No? <laughs> what happens when you have a last name with a name? <laughs> Um, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you so much, Professor Nelson Santana and Professor Derek Stadler for organizing and all the organizing members of LACUNY. But I have to say this, I am so proud of Nelson, of Professor Santana. Um, we worked together for a while uh, in the past, and we still do uh, collaborate. So I am so proud to see you as the president of LACUNY, Nelson. Thank you. Um, okay, so... As Nestle, Nestle, Professor Santana told you, I am a CUNY product. I began at Hostels and um, now I am working at City College. I began um, as a college work study student at the uh, library that I now founded. 
it was not the library, it was the Dominican Institute. And I had the idea of uh, organizing um, a space for scholars, students, and people from the community to come and learn more about Dominicans. So it began as a dream, as a, uh, a project, and now it's an internationally known library, um, and we have a amazing scholars working with us as well. And I can talk more, but I want others to, to talk, and then I can join later. Good morning, everyone, and thank you again to the organizers. Um, really appreciate this. It's really, really nice to have um, cross conversations and dialogue with my colleagues across CUNY. And as um, was read, I am currently the founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature at Megaris College. Uh, I have also concurrently and in the past served as chair of the English department. I served as chair for nine years and I also served as chair of the Department of Languages literature and philosophy at McGurvis College. My experiences are wide and varied. I've held administrative um, positions, worked um, with strategic planning, uh, middle states. I've run writing the disciplines program uh, programs. I've run um, basic skills and assessment. At the CUNY-wide level, I participated on a number of committees. I'm currently one of the commission founding, com, founding members of the Black Race and Ethnic Studies Commission, uh, which was funded by the Mellon Foundation. I am also on the CUNY um, Association of Black Faculty and Staff um, program. I'm also part of the Africana Discipline Councils. And um, while at Megervis College, although I started in composition, that's what my, my research was initially in composition and looking at student writers and how to improve it, I had an opportunity to become involved in the National Black Writers Conference, which was founded by the late John Oliver Killens at Megervis College in 1986. I worked um, as coordinator of the conference and in 2000, when uh, my colleague Elizabeth Nunez decided she no longer wanted to direct a conference, um, I stepped in and also at that time founded the Center for Black Literature. And that really um, provided me with an opportunity to really work um, with my colleagues within the discipline and across CUNY, across the country. The conference has attracted people from all over the world. And um, it, it's provided me with a way to, to uh, make sure that people understand the mission of the Center for Black Literature, which is to support writers throughout the African diaspora. I decided to put in the background um, my bookshelf in my home, which features one of the books that I collaborated with um, initially with the former provost and now president of Hostos Community College, um, she she uh, led a conference on the presence of Africa in the cultures of the Americas. And out of that, um, I ended up writing or editing the, the book that represented that. So that's an, an example of the collaboration that we've had. One of my collaborations in looking at writing in the disciplines was bringing together faculty from York College and from, um, I think it was Lehman College, we had about four colleges and we came together and, and conducted research on writing in the disciplines. I also had an opportunity while at Megervis College to serve in a program, which I think we should reinstitute and where you could go and um, teach at an, a sister college. I taught at the College of Staten Island. It was an opening experience for me and particularly for the students <laughs> who um, were not predominantly black, you know, McGurvis College is a predominantly black institution. So I, I taught African-American literature there and literature and of course, um, um, English composition. So my experiences have been wide and varied from on the faculty level and the college level 
and on the university level. And the Center for Black Literature is actually uh, modeled after the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for Black Literature and Creative Writing in Chicago. It is um, modeled that, but we do much more than that. In addition to conferences, we have writing workshops, we have a reading series, we have a book club, we have, I host a radio show, our writers on writing, we have a youth program where we're bringing text by Black writers into the classroom. So very excited um, to be um, part of this and very interested in seeing how the center can continue to work with its um, with other institutions and within McGurvis College. You know, I know we're going to get back to, you know, what what the library has done, but we've had a lot of partnerships within college. So I'm going to stop there because I sometimes tend to go on too long. <laughs> I, I do want to say we do have a little more, we do have a, a little more than an hour. Well, now we have an hour, exactly, but we have time. So please feel free to go on. <laughs> um, so I'm Christina Katapotis. Um, I've been at CUNY for about 12 years. Um, I started at CUNY in the Master of Arts and Liberal um, Sciences program at the Graduate Center. Um, and then worked for a nonprofit for a couple of years uh, before coming back for my PhD in English. Um, and then um, in the pandemic, graduated and um, began working on this amazing grant that um, was part of a larger series of grants that CUNY had, um, had um, been awarded from the Mellon Foundation. And so transformative learning in the humanities is, um, one of these grants, um, we received $2 million from the Mellon Foundation, and the goals of the grant are to support um, an equitable, inclusive, um, anti-racist pedagogy, and really working on professional development of um, faculty um, and students. Um, are, we have um, over 100 fellows, faculty fellows from all over CUNY who have um, spent time in seminars and doing collaborative projects with their students. Um, we just had a student summit last week that was so inspiring. Um, and we are trying to forward innovation um, and social justice and equity in the academy. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure to be a part of the grant. Um, the grant is unfortunately ending um, at the end of July, um, but uh, you know, hopefully you know someone who's been a part of it and can talk more about it. And we are going to be releasing a huge open educational resource on, um, on a website on the CUNY Commons so that anyone anywhere could see exactly how we did what we did and adapt it to your institution, your program, your department. And we hope that people will take this like a baton and run with it. And um, <clears throat> it's been such a joy to get to know um, people all over CUNY, CUNY START, CUNY SEEK, CUNY ASAP, um, and other like-minded programs, um, and such an honor to be here today with such inspiring people. So thank you for having me. Thank you all for, for being here. I, I do want to mention that uh, I do see some hands up uh, from the attendee side. Uh, therefore, if you please have a question, please, uh, if you're able to, uh, please drop it in the uh, Q&A uh, box that is available. Um, and uh, we will also, as we're having this conversation, we do not mind taking questions from the audience. Um, but just out of curiosity, uh, uh, Teresa Rienzo, uh, if you have a question, uh, uh, please feel free. I'm going to, yeah, please feel free to drop a, a, a message on the Q&A chat box. And I we will also, if you have a preference, please let us know if you want to speak. Uh, your out your you know say your question if you want to read it verbally thank you and yes I think we're off uh, to a great start thank you so much for sharing uh, your experiences and my goodness we can definitely follow up on so many things that uh, you shared uh, you all shared this morning including the grant writing etc um, uh, for oh something just came in and let me just see here 
Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Uh, can you please share with us how you and the CUNY institution that you are affiliated with support professional development for the members of our CUNY community? Example, faculty, graduate students, independent scholars, and perhaps scholars outside of CUNY. Thank you. Um, at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, um, even though I am the chief librarian, I work at the library uh, side, but we do have a, an archives and also the research unit. Um, professional development is a, at the core. And, and what do we mean by professional development? That would be good for us to define here. It's so broad, sitting with a um, student that is looking into go uh, in a field that is not sure if you have more knowledge, if you can give that person a letter, et cetera, that is professional development as well. Uh, nurturing and helping the people that you are working with. It does not matter that they are scholars or a PhD, uh, uh, distinguished professors, but uh, undergraduate students, high school students. We have at uh, the Dominican Institute, a program of internship uh, with high school students. Um, sometimes we all even take middle school students. We believe in beginning early and then nurturing people from the early uh, age all the way up to uh, graduate, graduate um, school. And professional development is a way for us as librarians. Well, I am a librarian, the other scholars are not, but uh, for us to continue learning in the profession and learning from each other and sharing knowledge and no thinking that we know it all. There's always ways that we can learn. Uh, I am the Dominican Studies Institute uh, la chief librarian, uh, but I do learn so much from Dr. Green's work and Dr. Karapaldi's work and all different work that jobs and, and, and initiatives that are uh, put together by different scholars and uh, professionals within CUNY. Uh, so the term professional development can be expanded in many different ways. And we do have um, fellowships with the Mellon. We have uh, also uh, the from the NEH, we have had different grants that we work with students, um, assistant and upcoming uh, scholars work together to put together different projects. For example, the First Blacks in the Americas project that we released a couple of years ago. If you go to the credit page, you're going to see students as well as junior scholars and as already established ones. So uh, for us at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, that's the way we do it, um, especially under the leadership of Dr. Ramon Hernandez, who is the director of the institute. I, I appreciate you saying that professional development really comes in so many ways. As, as I thought about the question, I realized we're doing professional development with our colleagues in other departments um, through projects we have with the library, through internships. So just, just beginning with the Center for Black Literature, um, our English BA program requires the students do internships. And we get um, several interns from the English department each year to work at the Center for Black Literature. And so um, they attend uh, workshops, they attend forums, uh, they um, also publish their own writing based on what they're reading and uh, conferences they're attending. We have a, a workshop with the African-American Literature Club, for example, where students have an opportunity to do research on Black writers throughout the African diaspora, to write book reviews, to um, even have a page where they can create a portfolio about their work. We work we've worked closely with the library over the years. Um, our students, uh, faculty, and the community have an opportunity to see what the library is um, exhibit through various exhibits and holdings that the library has because of its relationship to the Center for Black Literature. We were very, very excited to, for example, get a, a, the collection of Esther Jackson, who was very much involved in SNCC 
and in uh, the civil rights movement. The, she donated all of her books to the library. It became a resource that students could um, um, go to. And it actually, the exhibit won an award from the library, the li uh, an award. It was it's this phenomenal exhibit. We just recently had Woody King uh, Jr., who's a playwright, I mean, not playwright, a director and producer of the New Federal Theater. He donated three films to the library. Our students have an opportunity to um, view those films, you know, free of charge. Uh, we have other collections in the library that include the Civil Rights um, Children's Book Collection, a Civil Rights um, Collection that was compiled by the Department of Education. We have a wonderful um, exhibit that, um, a photography exhibit of, of Black writers. Students can, can use that as a, as a basis to go and research Black writers, people like Toni Morrison, Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni. It's their, their photos, huge photos are all over the library. And we were able to get the photographer to um, go to the library and set up that exhibit. We've had a number of other exhibits that represent Caribbean culture and um, the Black Lives Matter movement, Megger Wiley Evers. And uh, the library really serves as a resource. And then of course, um, in our classes, we use, we partner with the library for instruction related to research. Anytime I, I teach, I always make sure my students are, um, have library sessions where they can really learn how to do extended uh, research and really tailor the research according to what the requirements of the course are. The librarians work with our writing tutors and writing centers. Uh, we have a center for teaching and learning that does uh, workshops around, uh, professional development workshops around pedagogy, best practices on on doing uh, research, on conducting a, a uh, writing a grant, you know, like the PSC grant, doing uh, research that involves um, the hu human subjects, also doing research around and using, looking at best practice for writing in the disciplines and writing across the curriculum, looking at how you can um, establish portfolios um, we were very excited to get a CUNY-wide grant around social justice and diversity. We had some really exciting uh, professional development forums and workshops this year. So, for example, um, we had a student's firsthand account of the march, um, the the march that the march of hate that was held in Virginia. She was actually there. And, and that's looking at how to make people much more aware of what she experienced as a queer black brown woman and, and the fear. We had one on bringing our girls back, looking at sex tra trafficking and um, with black and brown girls and what can we do as a community to address the victimization of women. Uh, we had um, a Ramadan, Ramadan celebration you know, again, and also around something around Black Christianity and the um, Jewish religion. How can we make people much more aware of of um, issues and issues that that are anti-racist? Um, we we're having something this afternoon around it's very timely police account accountability in a divided society. You know, when we look at what's going on now. So we are doing really, um, if you look at professional development in a broad way, we are connecting with students and faculty and the community to educate. That's part of what we do at the National Black Writers Conference. It's called a conference, but it's a community gathering because it gives writers and scholars and the community and students an opportunity to come together and to have, I call it community conversations around the trends in black literature, around issues that people are writing about, around what it feels like to, to be silenced, 
around um, what of the, um, you know, the, the impact of politics on, on literature, the impact of racism on the literature that people are producing. And let me say one more thing, and I'll, I'll stop there. We're very, very excited that we, the Center for Black Literature, is partnering with the library through a grant we received through BRESI, the Black Race and Ethnic Studies Commission. We are doing a project that involves digitalizing our archives for the Center for Black Literature, the conferences that go back to 1986, and the um, all of the programs and recordings and photographs that we have from the Center for Black Literature. We are collecting it and we are working with the library to come up with a, a website that will be open to the college community and to the CUNY wide community and to the larger world so that there's ready documentation on what can be done if you look at the, the resources around you, you know, the technology, we have to take advantage of technology. And it's been a wonderful learning experience. And I'm just really excited to, to be part of this and um, to look at around CUNY, what other people are doing. And, you know, I, I'm just so excited. I have just have to um, give a big up to the Bresci Commission and Council because it has opened the door for so much research and so many products, um, projects, I mean, projects and curriculum and student activities that are really um, are in alignment with what CUNY should be doing. And that represents the diversity of CUNY and that puts at the center the importance of making sure that we are addressing um, black and brown students, we're addressing racism and anti-racism, social justice. And um, we're not just talking about it, we're actually involved in the work that's gonna make things change and happen. Um, at uh, TLH thinking about uh, professional development, something that we have been working on particularly with students, but also with our faculty fellows is how do you put this in your tenure and promotion file? How do you put this on your CVs? How do you use this to ask for a raise to learn how to advocate for yourself? So it starts right in the classroom where these faculty fellows have been, um, and before that, um, we had a spring 2021 workshop series um, where faculty across CUNY um, organized professional development workshops um, for their peers rather than inviting in outside speakers. and. By sharing these innovative practices, using active learning to get everyone to participate in the classroom, we know that student success correlates with student participation. So we need to get not just a hand raising few um, when we ask a question, we need to get everyone actively involved so that they know that their contributions, their voices matter. And going a step further from that, right? Not just doing a think pair share or an entry or exit ticket to help faculty be prepared to tell students, right? At the end of this, through a reflection, you're practicing leadership skills, communication skills, these skills that you need in your life and your career to advocate for yourself, to ask for a raise. Um, this is professional development, right? Group work, learning how to collaborate with others. That's not just busy work. That's learning how to work through problems with other people. That's learning to check the impulse to compete against one another and actually work together in a community of support and trust. So we try to emphasize and just make apparent to students and to faculty that these are the things we already do. We just need to make that final connection that this is related to your life outside of the academy. This is related to what you do in your community as a leader in your community, as a participant and engaged citizen in the world. Um, and then after being a part of TLH, understanding this is how I could put this on my CV. 
No, it's not service, which is often gendered and disregarded or devalued. It's leadership, right? We need to start characterizing what we do, all of the extra kind of um, labor, right? That comes with being a part of um, this mission at CUNY. That's leadership, right? And I think that's so important, learning that element of self-advocacy that we, we sometimes neglect. And so that's something that we've done at TLH where after our student summit, for example, I gave students examples of this is the section you add to your CV or resume, and this is what you put under it. Um, save this formal letter of recognition about what you just did and put that in your file so that when it's time for your annual review at your work, you give that to your supervisor and make sure that by the way, when you graduate, you let your supervisor know and ask for a raise because now you have a new credential. Um, so giving people that kind of um, language is so important, particularly when, um, many of us didn't get that kind of mentorship um, or many first generation students um, in particular might not have those kinds of skills. That is so important that everyone understands how to advocate for themselves. So that's one of those like more granular specific things that we work on. Um, but I think it's also important to have a program with flexibility to support the original ideas of, um, of all of the people involved in a project. So for example, in the spring of 2021, we we're in the height of the pandemic. We gave out these little micro grants um, where we were like, you have an idea for something that's working in your classroom, share it out, get $500. And by the way, if you involve your students, we'll give them $300 for collaborating with you. Um, and we did that in the spring and we hosted, um, or we facilitated 75 workshops organized by faculty. There were about 90 faculty involved and 80 students involved instead of hiring outside consultants or outside speakers to come in. Um, we, for our uh, faculty fellowships, 25% of our faculty were adjuncts. Um, and for my perspective, I've been an adjunct. I was adjuncting um, at Hunter College as a graduate student and afterward. Um, and I don't remember there being opportunities like that available to me as an adjunct. And part of that is the way that tax levy funds work, that it's really hard to pay people um, for their labor and their service. But um, that's something that I think is singular and unique about some of this effort. And I just wanna plug the Futures Initiative at the Graduate Center run by Adashima Oyo, Kathy Ann Davidson, and Shelly Eversley is coming in. Um, and there is another place, this is at the Graduate Center. The Graduate Fellows there put on events every semester and they're open to anyone at CUNY. They're generally public events. And there's so much there, so much support for adjuncts in particular who are learning how to teach for the first time. Maybe they haven't even taught a course yet um, or professors toward the end of their career who have been teaching a long time but wanna brush up, you know? Um, and this is really the place where um, equitable practices go all the way down to office meetings where everyone takes a turn setting the agenda and running a meeting where everyone puts in an item on the agenda. Um, and this is another form of professional development. And we think about that even with our staff at CLH. Um, we have mostly graduate students who are our staff um, and either former or current graduate students. And they're given the space and the flexibility to come up with ideas on their own, to introduce something, use that idea to take the lead on something. And um, we've gone to conferences. Uh, that's another form of professional development. But having the opportunity to take an idea and see it through, we did, um, as a graduate student, I did a Wikipedia edit-a-thon for feminist and queer um, 
Wikipedia articles. Uh, recently this year, we had um, a Douglas Day celebration where at three CUNY campuses, um, people transcribed the works of Marianne Shad Carey, um, the first African American woman um, in North America to be an editor. And I can put the uh, link in the chat to Douglas Day. Um, and so being able to have the flexibility in the room for not just someone at the head of a department or the head of a program to be dictating, right, what we're going to do, but to have everyone in a community have the ability and flexibility and the room to lead, um, to take the lead on a project, I think is so important. And that's another aspect of professional development for staff, as many, much of CUNY is run by our students by you know who are also staff who do all of these different roles and so i think that's important too for us to consider how we bring these equitable structures into our day-to-day -day, um lives and uh and work um as well so those are just some of the examples of what we what we try to do thank you three for uh answering the, this question in such a marvelous uh, way. I mean, truly, truly uh, appreciate it. For, for those colleagues outside of CUNY and even those within, because sometimes we're in little silos, please be aware that there are many funding and professional development opportunities for people affiliated with CUNY, right? Including funding and non-funding made available through the Futures Initiatives, as noted by Dr. Katopoulos, and the Black Race and Ethnic Studies Initiative, Bressy, as noted by Dr. Green. We also have the, you know, just a small sample uh, we also have the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute Fellowship, Faculty Fellowship Publication Program, FFPP, Professional Staff Congress of the City University of New York, or PSC CUNY Traditional Awards, right, which are grants that support our research. And it's not just support in research, right, but also mentorship, as in the case of the FFPP. And uh, Dr. Green, we do have an audience question, but I see that Dr. Green's hand is up. And would you like to say something, Dr. Green? Uh, I just wanted to add to what um, Dr. Katapotis um, said about the importance of having faculty initiate grants and the importance of making sure that you're including adjunct faculty. When I was chairperson, I always insisted that we do professional development activities at the beginning of each semester. And the uh, most many, many, we as a, in the English department, of course, we had as many as 60, you know, adjunct faculty, and they really appreciated it and looked forward to it. And I, and taking as someone who came out of um, initially out of composition and recognizing the importance of having people uh, give their voice and give their ideas, I always made sure that adjunct faculty as well as full-time faculty had an opportunity to present on best practices to, to generate the, the questions and discussions. And that was so valuable. And, and they, they, the uh, faculty just reiterated how, how important that was. So I just wanted to, to um, echo that, that it's really, really important to have things that are generated, not to have a top-down approach. There are too many times in CUNY where I've seen, and even within in my own college, you see where people say, okay, we're gonna bring in the experts with the assumption that the experts are not within your own college or university. And that's one of the things I like, I like when, you, when, when we're doing these conferences and programs, we have to use ourselves. So I, I also commend you for bringing in CUNY people to talk about this, <laughs> then we can showcase what we're doing. Thank you so much for those kind words. Professor Aponte, I believe I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. I, I just want to mention, um, going back to what Bia said, all to support staff are very important. Uh, and uh, I began as a work study student. I am a full professor. So I have have gone through all the processes through throughout CUNY and I know how hard it might be. Uh, but bringing support staff as well as faculty, as students, and everyone that works at the institution, if you're working at, this, at that institution, it means that you care and you want uh, to, to be part of, of the uh, processes. 
So it's important to include, inclusive, including everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, the voice that you're going to bring. And that uh, makes the institution grow and the individual as well. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Professor Ponte and Dr. Grant, Dr. Katopoulos. Um, we have uh, a unanimous question here from an audience member, um, in which I will read. And our panelists noted grants, including funding from the Mellon Foundation, for example, as someone who has not completely, who has not been completely successful at securing grants. What advice would you give to someone like me who has yet to land a major grant, like a National Endowment for the Humanities (NEH) or a National Institutes of Health (NIH)? And anyone can answer this question because you're all masterful grant writers. <laughs> I would say persistence, persistence, persistence. Um, make sure that when you are applying for the grant, you contact your program officer before you talk to your program officer about the criteria they're looking for. You, um, also, if you don't receive the grant, you go back and you find out what the missing elements were. Um, when I, you know, I've I've been really, really um, fortunate to, we, I'm not getting as much as I want, but for example, we've gotten the National Endowment for the Arts on a consistent basis. And Sim, once you get the grant, any grant you get, documentation. You know, sometimes as someone who's also been a juror for grants, when I look at applications, part of it ends up being problematic because the person is not zeroing in on what the funder is asking. Take the language that the funder is using and give that language back. Be as specific and concrete as you can. Pay attention to details and also get someone else to read it and to review it. Don't rely on the privileged information that you may have about what you think you said and what you actually said. You know, that's that's another um, another point. So, um, and and I started out with the PS um, CUNY grants. You know, that was those my first grants. I, I didn't get my first one. And I went, I found out why. I talked to the program officer and I realized I applied in the wrong category. I was an English major, so I applied to English. But the grant was around writing in the disciplines. So I had, should have applied in another area. So you, you, you really have to really pay attention and, and not be afraid to be persistent. Um, I'll just add to that. Um, I found the STAR method really helpful. It's helped me to win um, a lot of, and I would say too, just like um, what Dr. Green said, small money, leads to big money, right? Show it like applying for the small things, showing that others have invested in your work um, is so helpful, just like these stepping stones. But the STAR method I, has really helped me. And um, I wrote a blog post about this, particularly for showing the, the value of a dissertation project. So this is uh, a little bit specific to that, but um, if that could be shared um, with everyone um, in the STAR method, S is for situation, where specifically is the need for your work, demonstrating need first. Then the task, how is, like, what is the task at hand for addressing the situation? And then the action, what particular actions are you going to take? What's within your power? Um, with these grant funds, um, what action will you take? Um, what specific um, support will this grant go toward? And then results. And I feel like academics, we don't always spend a lot of time on results. Um, and the results are probably the most important part of selling yourself, right? Um, you're investing in the results, basically. Um, so showing, for example, with uh, TLH. Um, I just recently kind of took stock of, um, you know, at the end of every uh, event, we asked people, are you teaching? Um, and if you're teaching, how many students are you teaching right now? Well, 
we can use that to say, all right, these events were attended by, I think it's six or 7,000 people over the course of three years. And we estimate that they were teaching about 47,000 students. That's showing impact, right? That's showing like the results are not just, you know, the, the perceived impact, but how we're helping students to feel that the university is investing in them, how we're helping faculty to feel that the university is investing in them. Um, getting students engaged leads to student success. So better retention, better professional development for their careers. Um, focusing on that um, can help to target different audiences, right? Both administrators who are interested in the bottom line, but also people who are interested in this mission of equity and justice and higher ed and beyond. Um, so whatever the mission is, like Dr. Green said, showing how the results of your project will attain some of the mission of the funders um, is so important. And do not get discouraged, even though if you receive a lot of rejections, uh, it's okay. Uh, just go on and then apply and reapply and then apply for others. Uh, and then getting one grant, as many of you said, is going to help you get the others because now they know that you can manage a grant and you know how to uh, work with it and, and the results that you just uh, mentioned. Uh, the, uh, for example, at the Dominican Institute, uh, we work as, as a team. We uh, um, rarely write grants uh, only by ourselves. Uh, we make sure that others see what we're writing. Uh, sometimes you think that what you need and what you're presenting uh, is, is, is the best uh, because you know, you understand the importance of what you're looking for, the money that you need to do this uh, X and Y uh, project. But others outside of your institution might think that, oh, why do Domin why Dominicans? Why do we have to give money to Dominicans? You have to argue that. You have to um, uh, insert Dominican studies within the mainstream, within uh, the US um, academy uh, and the like. Uh, and that for that, you need other eyes. You need eyes outside perhaps the institution uh, to help you. Um, with that and within the institution as well, working with others. Uh, I think that's very important. And uh, you have a lot of people at CUNY that can um, help you read your work. Uh, Professor Santana is an expert now uh, in writing grants. So <laughs> I know he's very busy, but uh, we can, all of us can help each other. And I think that's the key. I just want to quickly add to that because that's such an important point. And I feel like when we're celebrating success, we forget to mention the stumbling blocks along the way. And I just wanna say that I mentioned in the beginning that I came to CUNY as a master's of arts and liberal studies student. That's because I was rejected from the English PhD program and I was invited to apply for the master's. And then I applied again for the PhD in English and I was rejected a second time because I didn't have the language I needed. And I did reach out to one of the programs I applied for and I asked them for advice. And they said, you're applying to an English program, but you're too interdisciplinary. Just focus on English. You know, you can do the interdisciplinary work once you get in, but just for the application, meet the brief, just like Dr. Green said. The third time I applied, I submitted just English stuff. I took out all my interdisciplinary work and then I got in on the wait list, the wait list first without funding. And then I moved up to off the wait list and I was funded. So it's not a linear path. And I learned so much from asking for advice from people where I got, had been rejected. And it was so helpful to, to talk to students who had gotten in and ask them for like, you know, ask them more about it. So asking people, oh, you got this NEH grant, tell me about, you know, would you share it with me? You know, just asking to be collaborative and, and to get the advice. And I think persistence is so important. Thank you all so much. Uh, we have a comment on the Q&A box. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but 
I will read it out loud. From Alicia Sully, shout out to having been through MALS with Christina. So <laughs> um, in, in answering, uh, in you three answering the question, there were just some uh, quotes that I extrapolated, which we will share on, on, on our Twitter, official Lacuni Twitter account. But uh, Dr. Katopoulos, you stated, quote, small money leads to big money. Um, and when we celebrate success, we often forget the assembling, assembling blocks that led us there, right? Dr. Green, uh, you know, you, you shared with us something very personal as well, right? You did not obtain your first PSC CUNY grant because you did not apply to the uh, quote unquote right panel. But then afterward, you applied to the more appropriate panel. And I can share with you that I, I was on the same boat. I applied for my first uh, PSC CUNY, did not get it. Um, and Jensen, who's in the audience, I shared with him my rejection letter actually two weeks ago or so. And then I showed him the past three years, I've actually gotten those PSC CUNY grants, to, you know, uh, traditional A and two traditional B, because I've applied to the correct panel, right? I had a mentor who guided me and, and, and informed me, you know, you should tweak this. So thank you, Dr. Green, for sharing this piece of advice. And Professor Aponte, yes, quote, do not get discouraged, apply, apply, and apply. You know, at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, we work as a team. We rarely write a grant on our own. And these pieces of advice are, are so, so important. We, you know, we thank you for, for sharing uh, them. Now, let's go on to, uh, I think we have time for at least one more question, right? Uh, the audience, please feel free to, to send more, make any, share any comments. Uh, we will be um, be sure to, to, to end the session at 1130 as we want to provide uh, the following uh panelists with sufficient time so they can prepare. Uh, uh, and the next panels, by the way, begin at 11.45 a.m. Um, and we ask that those panelists will be presenting there and the moderators and the co-hosts that you arrive uh, at least 15, 10 to 15 minutes before. Uh, so next question. Last year's Lacuni Institute theme, excuse me, this year's Lacuni Institute theme revolves around the concept of the evolving library through professional development. One of our plenary speakers is a professionally trained librarian, while all three of you are masterful researchers who have made important interventions within your own disciplines. Can you please share with us where do you currently see the library and the concept of librarianship and where do you see it evolving or going? Um, uh, collaboration, networking. For example, at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, we, we, we work very closely with the library and the archives of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Centro at Hunter College, the Institute for Mexican Studies at Lehman College, now the Haitian Studies Institute at Brooklyn College, and other, other uh, not only CUNY, but for example, also the seminar for the acquisition of library, uh, material, acquisition of library materials, along that Nelson is part of, Jensen Santana that is in the audience, Jensen Ortiz that is in the audience as well, is part of. So librarianship is no longer the um, that librarian that used to, to be a, a white person, uh, very uh, you know sophisticated and telling people to stop talking. No, librarians look like me and have an accent like me. Uh, many of us are like that and it's so important uh, to 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 be part of this profession and to help others into their profession as well. And Professor Santana knows about this because he worked with us at the Kennedy Dominican Studies Institute. And we encourage people to get their degrees in library sciences and to continue on and, and to get all the credentials that they can so they can be part of this um, field as uh, professors, as um, scholars and researchers. But librarianship is no longer you know, silo, it's no longer you know, its own spaces, but uh, collaboration and sharing knowledge and producing knowledge, preserving knowledge, and making it available. Producing knowledge, making, making, making knowledge available. I, I like what you said. And I would definitely agree with you that we need to think about the library in a different space. I would say a more public space, a more community space where you have an exchange, you're bringing in the community and you're also creating spaces where 
students can have a variety, a wider range of experiences. They're not just sitting and doing their research. They can come and view films. They can be small seminar rooms where they are um, listening to a, a lecture. They can, um, you know, create their own exhibits, you know, help to create their own exhibits. It has to be much more interactive. I would love to see, for example, um, Moet Maker Evers, and I, I, I'm not sure how much this is done at other CUNY um, institutions, but to see a more robust scholarship program with students where students are actively involved in doing research and scholarship and they receive stipends um, for that. I think the, these students need the support and how to, to do research, which is much more complicated and complex than it was when I was doing it um, years ago. You know, there's so many sources and how do you become much more um, discriminatory about the kind of research you, you're doing and learn to be very, very critical um, in order to determine the validity and the reliability of the research. I think we need a lot more work with that. Uh, we, we have a group of people who are growing up um, where the primary source of information is the internet. And unfortunately, there are too many people who don't know how to distinguish between um, what's accurate and what is not, and who, who are not motivated to do the research, who see going to Google as evidence of, you know, that they've done the research. So we, we, we need to, the only way people are going to learn that is if they're involved in doing that research themselves. So we need many more programs where students are paired with faculty and um, paired with mentors who can engage them in the kind of research and really help them to understand what it means to, to write and, and to do research. Yeah, a few years ago, one of the articles I share with my students um, when I do run the internship seminar is the number of people in the academy, the number of students who are paying to have people write their papers. Uh, there, there are people who are making a lot of money writing student papers, particularly for students in their first language is not English. How can we address that? You know, how can we get around that? Um, we have to be come up with some specific interventions and try to create an atmosphere where a student doesn't feel that's what they have to do in order to, to gain a, um, a good grade and to be proficient. We have to have that support that's built in to um, the library and recognizing that diversity, in diversity we have, um, we have challenges, but we also have strengths. And I always say to my students who, who speak English as a second language, I, I have to admire you because if I had to go to another country and study completely in another language, I don't know how I would do it. So I commend you. So let's look at how we can work this out together. Um, just to add to um, what's been said, um, I think all of these are so important and to speak specifically to something that um, Dr. Green had said, you know, when students go to Google something, I learned so much from our um, active uh, digital librarians who are um, involved in Wikipedia edits who are Wikipedians and who taught me uh, like Meg Wacha, for example, they taught me about how to edit articles on the back end. And I've gone on to teach my students about how to properly cite um, sources and edit articles on the back end. And, you know, for example, a Wikipedia article about Pocahontas, you look up Pocahontas and you see that much of it, the article is like the Disney story. Um, and it's changing now. I see it changing. I keep up. But um, teaching students how to use their college education to actively participate in updating public knowledge, um, you know, something that is collectively sourced online and using that knowledge 
to tell the story of someone like Pocahontas, um, not from a white perspective, but sharing the story that Pocahontas's ancestors have shared online and what indigenous authors are saying about that story. Um, you know, using a college education to be a part of that public knowledge and conversation so that someone who looks at Pocahontas online, Googles it, who doesn't have that privilege of a college education gets to see the work of someone who shared that knowledge out. And that's part of CUNY's mission, right? Knowledge is a public good. And I think our librarians who are doing an amazing job of, um, of spreading that and sharing that. And I've learned so much from them. And that's something I learned too as a faculty member, um, you know, as adjunct faculty, that librarians are not just for students, but they're for faculty as well. And I think that, you know, what I see from other institutions, um, they're opening up these uh, offices to support faculty research. And I feel like that's a little bit of doubling the work, right? Reinventing the wheel to some extent. Um, and that's an inefficiency as well. Um, why are these offices of research being opened when faculty can learn so much from our libraries where research is being done? And so why are we investing even more resources outside of the libraries instead of investing them in the libraries so that more of that work can happen? And that's something that I see in terms of the future, right? Being louder about what we already have here, being louder about our outcomes, our results, asking people, hey, I really enjoyed meeting with you last year about your research. Did you publish that article? You know, do you need any help? Um, did you get that grant? And keeping track, right? Showing impact so that we can have that arsenal of, look, this is what we've accomplished. This is how many people we've, this is, you know, this is how many people, how many research projects, how many articles and books like FFPP, for example, is great at tracking their um, impact. And I think that that's really the future is trying to use what we have and invest more rather than spreading resources even thinner. Um, and I think, you know, showing that like, this is the most efficient way to use our resources. So let's double down and put more where we already have good things going so that we can do more with them rather than opening up a whole new separate office. Um, so that's just a, a thought that I have about how we could do that smarter. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Aponte, I see that your hand is up. Yes, quickly. Um, talking about faculty and librarians, uh, we are faculty at the CUNY level. And we have to go through the same process that all faculty members have. So making sure librarians are sitting at the table with the faculty uh, within the college, the faculty standing to different committees, the working groups, uh, that we have a voice in there. Uh, because we we are faculty like everyone else, so why not um, that we also can say what we need and how can we help? For example, in the strategic planning of the colleges that we belong, why the libraries just mentioned perhaps once? No, it needs to be integrated within that strategic planning. So all all of us can work together and and research. Um, the library, I see it as the backbone of the institution, the heart of the institution. So making sure that librarians are recognized as such. Thank you all. Um, you have provided so many gems, so many nuggets, so much piece of advice uh, for us uh, to continue moving forward in our work and our scholarship. We have only four minutes remaining. Um, again, I, I, I'm not sure if this question is, is even necessary because you've actually um, provided so many so much advice in your own answers and your own responses um but if you can in in just one minute very succinctly can you each uh perhaps uh 
If you had to leave us here, the attendees of the, the CUNY Institute 2023 with one piece of advice, what would that piece of advice be? Sorry for putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. One, one of the, the words that came to me as we were talking is the idea of community. And the library as a, a public space and a community that ends up being a merger between the community and the academic school, the academic institution. So uh, again, the public space where you can go and get um, authentic uh, research and, and don't, don't forget that we're part of a larger community. So I would, I like that, that concept. Thank you, Dr. Green. Dr. Katopoulos or Professor Ponte? Um, I can go um, just briefly to echo what Dr. Green said, turning to each other um, for strength and to find hope and optimism in a transformed university um, because we need to fill up the well of ourselves and our ability to continue to apply for things, to come out of a pandemic when many of us are burnt out to continue to believe that the work has meaning and purpose and to find that with each other and the strength with each other to continue persevering. Um, because with budget cuts and um, difficult times, um, we need each other more than ever. And to kind of check that impulse to compete against one another and share, to be collaborative. And I just wanna give a shout out to the book uh, by Baranda L. Montgomery on lessons from plants. She's a black woman uh, biologist and she talks about this in that book, Lessons from Plants, and I highly recommend it. It has given me so much hope in community as has Bell Hooks and Audrey Lord and Tony K. Bambara and June Jordan and all of our CUNY foremothers uh, before us. And so um, looking to each other for strength. Uh, yes, and community, working together, sharing knowledge. Uh, do not think that if you tell someone um, uh, something about your research, that's going to be stolen and you cannot, no, 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 share and work collaboratively. That's a, a key. And believe in what you're doing. Enjoy it um, and transmit that joy to others. Uh, librarians um, are a a privileged uh, people uh, within the, the college uh, world. We at CUNY are talking a lot about mobility, financial mobility, but think also about intellectual mobility and um, knowledge mobility. Every day you learn something. I learned so much today. Thank you so much. I'm going to be looking into all this information and sharing this with others. And um, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I, I just want to say, I don't know about Christina, but of course, um, I thought about doing my master's in library science. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of, you know, if you're a natural reader and researcher, that's that's a natural way to come. And, and just want to hold up um, the importance of, of the critical, looking at things with a critical eye, because we have so much misinformation. How do we turn that around? It's our responsibilities. As, as faculty and as students and as librarians to lead the charge in turning that around and, and shaping what we get and looking at it critically. Thank you so much for everything. Um, I just want to read a comment from Dr. Isabel Espinal, who is one of our presenters at this year's Lacuni Institute. And she wrote, yes to more resources and investment for librarians and libraries. We need more librarians. Thank you for your advocacy, Dr. Katopoulos. Yes to what Professor Sara Ponte is saying about inclusion of librarians in strategic planning. And Dr. Espinal is also a librarian, right? So <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, we have actually dropped uh, the links uh, for the next sessions. The room might be the passcode, but everyone should also have this in your, in, you should have received the email with this information. I presume that you did receive this information because you have made it to today's opening and plenary session. Um, again, Dr. Topudis, Dr. Green, and Professor Aponte, thank you so much for being here. 
thank you for everyone who joined us today. And the recording of this uh, open of this plenary and opening session will be made available in the coming months. And thank you, Professor Vice President Derek Stadra, for being with us today as well. Thank you, Nelson. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. This is yeah. lovely. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your um, for spearheading this. Really Gracias. appreciate the opportunity. Gracias. <laughs> it's a team effort. See you on the next sessions. Okay.